Invocation Trilogy. Kuba, tell us a little bit about the origin of this project. Um, in 2017, um, I was one of the finalists for the John Fries Award. Um, and um, in consultation with, um, with Consuelo uh, Cavanilla, um, had this idea of making a work that touched on a few of the things that um, had been kicking around in my work for years and years, um, namely um, uh, leftist politics, um, but also language and music um, and cinema history. Um, so originally it was going to be built on an uh, interrogation, a series of famous interrogations um, in the late 60s in the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, with, with some authors. So I kind of played around with um, these, the idea of interrogation and, um, you know, and the way that they're presented um, in history, the way presented by one side, by another side, um, and kind of tried to step outside of it and kind of really get to the essence of what it is to, um, you know, to, to really talk politics and talk what politics is for. Um, and that was a kind of starting point in this work. And then I kind of realized that there's a lot more I wanted to do with it. And I want to make it more, more components to it. And then um, I realized that that would be too much for that particular context in a group exhibition. Um, so I kind of decided at that point, all right, this is going to be a trilogy. Priznati, robotě jaké nezahu, kad bylo by tět. Nad, Vankovič peroň, že ne robit nezahu, kad jde mu nezahu, vás nezahu. Já robotě nezahu dla mě, robotě nezahu dla Ignat. What was it about um, the trilogy structure itself that actually appeal to you uh i had never done one <laughs> and it just felt like, um it's you know it's the thing you do as a filmmaker at some point you make a a trilogy i guess and in hindsight it was it's quite a um uh prison sentence because you're committed to this thing now and you know and your ideas kind of go in different directions and or you get interested in something else and or you feel like you don't want to be kind of hemmed in to one thing um, so I, I, you know, I've done some other works in between, um, but it did really feel for a while there, like, Ugh, I just want to actually change this, that I set this pattern that I set up in the first one, um, you know, four years later. Mm. Um, but, you know, ultimately now that it's done, I'm very happy that there was a trilogy and then I could get through that whole, um, angle of kind of existential mystical being, um, and radical 20th century politics and language um, and kind of really look at those from a few different angles. So language is a really big part of your practice more broadly, but with the trilogy, can you just talk a little bit about your approach to language, but also a little bit about your, your own cultural background? Um, well, I, I was born in Poland and I came to Australia as a, uh, as a small child. Um, and I grew up in a Polish speaking household um, we only spoke Polish at home, but my parents, you know, they learned Russian at school. Um, my dad's something of a kind of amateur polyglot. <clears throat> you know, he speaks Polish and English, but also um, German and Russian and, um, you know, Latin at one point and French. And, you know, he worked with a Mongolian man for a year and picked up quite a bit of Mongolian from, <laughs> from that. So he, so, you know, language is always kind of this, uh, very loaded um, system of um, expressing at once who we were, um, but also um, where we sit within a greater network of different immigrants and different um, international communities. Um, and then things like SBS, you know, in Australia, the, um, you know, not so much now, but throughout the 80s and 90s, a lot of its programming was built around world cinema and you know and there was always this kind of game that we play of trying to identify 
um, what language it is. Like, you know, we, my dad turned on the TV and we quickly kind of go, oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, and you look for little clues and you sometimes cheat by kind of perhaps knowing the actors or, um, you know, so language is always a big thing. And then when I was at an undergraduate at uni, I did the first work that kind of really looked at the idea of language as not a communicatory device directly, but indirectly as something that says foreignness. And I did this video with a made up language that sounded at times you'd go, is that Polish? No. Or is that Hebrew? Is that Arabic? Like it had all these kind of elements of different, very diverse language groups. Um, in the end, the only thing it communicated, other than what it said in the subtitles, was foreign. So, and that's been kind of something I've played with over time. And in the last maybe five years, um, I've really precisioned that kind of world language um, mash into something more specifically around Slavic languages. Um, so this language, I kind of, which I kind of jokingly call shni shni, um, because that's, um, I think my kids would jokingly say, stop speaking shni shni, um, when I'd just be rambling around the house. But it would be um, a little bit of Polish, a little bit of Russian, which I've been kind of slowly learning over the years, um, but then little bits of kind of Bulgarian, um, phonemes, you know, not exactly words, but the kind of little trills that you find in specific variants of Slavic languages, um, you know, a bit of Ukrainian, a bit of uh, Serbo-Croat. Um, and I, so it's not a consistent language. It's, it's a ficto language. You can't kind of, there's no consistent grammar. There's no rules. Some words consistently reappear and there's conjugations of them, but you couldn't really kind of translate it um, into any other language. That said, uh, the idea has always been for Slav, any Slavic language speaker um, could feel like, oh yeah, I know that, I know what I know what they're talking about, I know what's going on, um, but not quite be able to put their finger on it. Uczynki mocnego bluetooth. Ja nie mogę rozgawiać to na całego, za to ja mogę rozgawiać to, co było o czym ważne. Ruchają teraz. No i ruchają, ruchają, no mogło być otrzymywane. Choć można tu przeskazywać, bo, bo nie mogli o nim spróbować widać. A kazu smatrycie tego dalszego na nasej czas? A wy oczywiście panajmiecie cjono kalendo o tywa otrumanie. Cjo budo otrumanie, no budo o kakajo było na fa. The three films are narrated by a figure that you play this character mm. that you play and the translation appears as subtitle. Um, so in some ways we're at your mercy where, you know, that your that whatever story you're telling is, is accurate to the language, I guess, that we're hearing. And so that's mm. kind of an interesting um, part of the work. The idea of storytelling is quite, is quite central to the trilogy. Um, we, particularly in the third film, which is the most ambitious feature length of the, of the three, Connection to the Sticks, you, you tell us you tell a number of stories and that take us through all manner of places in Eastern Europe. Um, but they, you know there's this sense that it's fact and fiction that it coalesces between myth and mysticism. You know your own personal narratives mm -hmm. are there, but they also kind of overlap with other kind of broader global political histories. Can you tell us a little bit about that kind of mash of, of um, fact and fiction in your work? Um... Yeah, I've always I, I I like the idea of um, of that blurred fact and fiction area. I I'm, I'm interested also as my other kind of um, branch of my video art practice. I do kind of like video essays, essay film sort of things, kind of in the tradition of Chris Marker or um, Chantal Ackerman. And you survey the crowds before you. You stand back. Oh. 
and you put the crowds in. You know, the whole thing about the essay is that it's, um, it's presented as nonfiction to some degree, but it's also filtered deeply through personal experience, usually non-expert personal experience. Um, so I like the idea of taking, you know, the, uh, the consensual reality of the world and then kind of filtering it through and, you know, certain things get blocked and certain things come out um, with maybe more emphasis than they do um, for any other person's experience. And then like putting little spins on things. Um, you know, I like the idea of the hoax um, because that always sits in this in-between zone of like, is it, you know, it has to be real enough to be convincing. It can't be absolutely fictional. It has to kind of occupy the clothing um, and the landscape of reality, but perhaps have, you know, a fake mustache and, you know, Groucho Marx glasses on and that's the, it's artifice. And we believe that or we don't. And even the not believing it is part of engaging with blur between fact and fiction. Mm. Um, and, and in this, and in this, in the third of the trilogy, Connection of the Sticks, there I really like that, um, really go deep into looking at um, real histories, personal histories, um, but also structures of particularly kind of um, metaphysical or transrational um, uh, experiences in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. There's a particular flavor. Um, if you read through histories or you know, kind of various websites, um, you see, particular pattern um, of things reappearing and being restructured and rewritten. It's, it's, you know, there's a real folklore to those kind of tales of the um, phenomena of the world, that kind of, that genre of storytelling. Um, so it taps into that kind of, I guess, a little bit. So with Connection to Sticks, tell us a little bit about um, the film itself. I mean, you, you take us on a journey across a vast um, terrain of Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. Um, can you just tell us, uh, talk a little bit to that um, idea of, of the constellation of places and um, how they all form, up, form to tell this story? Um, well, it, it, the whole, I know I jokingly dismissively kind of say it's about Eastern Europe, kind mm -hmm. of referring to that joke about um, speed reading um, Tolstoy's War and Peace and, and the conclusion being it's about Russia. You know, it's, I mm -hmm. like that idea of uh, taking Eastern Europe as a cultural phenomena, one that doesn't necessarily even exist within Eastern Europe quite the same way as it does outside of Eastern Europe. Um, you know, it has a real history. Eastern Europe as a unified mass, you know, really only goes back to the 17th, 18th century as a concept. And it's a concept devised by the French and the, um, and the Germans to a lesser extent and the British and you know, it's this, it's the other, but it's not the other other. It's this kind of liminal zone between the, the East that Western Europe colonized um, and the, you know, quote unquote, civilized West of Western Europe. Um, you know, and there's lots of stories that kind of you see in a lot of um, myths uh, about co colonized people. Um, you know, that there's abhorrent sexual, proclivities and weird ideas of um, decency and faith and religion. Um, so I'm really kind of taking those tropes and they still exist. That's, you know, every time you watch a action movie, you know, the, with a Russian or Ukrainian, you know, mob leader villain, they have the same thing of being to some extent refined and, you know, quoting, um, you know, Rilke or, or, you know, going to the opera and then, without you know shedding a tear crack you know the spine of a enemy or something it's the same or you know borat or any of these kind of tropes they're always playing with the same um eastern european figure the slavic figure mm. talk a little bit about the figure of lenin in the work because um it is very much a centralizing figure that haunts the entire trilogy mm -hmm. um particularly um I'm struck in the connection of the sticks by that scene, which takes us through all of the different um, statues of Lenin. And it's quite a beautiful scene. It's this indexicality of Lenin that is kind of plotted through all of these different um, statues that all, you know, that you personalize as well. 
you give them into different, this one's smiling, this one's leaning, this one's about to, you know, you know, spring into action. Can you tell us a little bit about that fascination with Lennon that you have? Um, the, well, it's, I personally, as a um, political theorist, I find I, I, I like Lennon. Yeah. I'm, I'll, I'm coming out as some, um, coming out as a Lennon fan. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, this particular trilogy, the first one started in 2017, which is 100 years. Um, after the Russian Revolution, um, and this last one, um, Connection of the Six, uh, is the uh, 30th anniversary of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So they're just quite nice bookends um, for a certain era in Eastern Europe, kind of quite a unifying moment, even, um, you know, although a lot of people will balk at the idea that there was this kind of moment where Eastern Europe was somehow um, more or less one unit um, for, for better and for worse. And, you know, I, and a lot of the, pro, you know, I feel like a lot of the, the experience of um, the socialist project of the 20th century in Eastern Europe or everywhere really um, has been um, co-opted by um, Western interpretations of it, even within Eastern Europe. So it was uniformly bad. There was nothing of value there. Um, it was um, a terrible mistake and we must never do it again. And, um, you know, the problem with that in this particular instance is that there are the, a lot of the grievances and issues that um, led to the explosion of um, socialism within Eastern Europe um, are still present. They never left. And in fact, the, um, its edges are sharper, um, you know, hotter and more present and in our faces than um, have been for a long time. And so the, you know, the conditions for creating this sort of movement are once again in, in the air. And rather than rejecting everything that had been done through that experiment, um, you know, you the wise thing to do would be to go back, look at it, look at it with fresh eyes or with sober eyes, and learn from the mistakes and note the effects of the positive things of that era, and you know, and build on them and, and move forward rather than restarting again from scratch and making another series of false ends. You know, that life is precious and the planet is precious, it's so that it, there is a sense of urgency now and. The best way to address that, I think, is by learning from the 20th century. Mm. Um, and, and Lenin really becomes a symbol. Um, you know, I, I, I like Lenin as a writer and I find him an interesting historical figure, um, you know, and, a, and a statesman as well. Um, it's, but, you know, I kind of poke at the, the worship and the kind of idolatry of a figure. Um, you know, Lenin famously was terribly opposed to that idea. And um, the fact that there it does play a certain play into a certain type of religious or spiritual feeling of identifying a figure as a leader um, and having shrines and having kind of inanimate objects that take on a certain um, power just by being focuses of our you know passions and our energies Lenin really becomes this nice um, transition point from uh, a symbol of socialism and hope for, you know, moving beyond um, capitalism and also a symbol of um, uh, spiritual focus, I guess. So on the one hand, we've got Lenin, we've got these big political figures that loom quite large in the um, imaginary, but then we've also got a lot of family figures for you, you know, your um the this, this scene about your grandfather, which I think is very moving, and also particularly um, given that he passed away last month, um, you know, the, what, what is it that you learn from your own, I guess, ancestors and your own, you know, the people within your family, but also knowing that this is a work that's very much made with your family, that made, mm -hmm. you know, you, your, your kids are in it, you worked with your partner, you worked with your brother your father, you know, your auntie. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of interested in the, the, that as well, that on the one hand, we've got these big sweeping 
political stories and political histories, but there's also the way that's localized within your own kind of familial mm -hmm. context. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, this morning we were listening to a, ra to a radio interview where I was asked a similar question and my 12 year old son answered it before I answered it on the radio and said, oh, easy, unpaid labor. And <laughs> to an extent, that's a large part. <laughs> when working on a really small budget, it meant that I could, um, you know, work with the people that are around me, the people that are willing to put their heart and soul into it. Um, you know, and my children and my brother and my family members, but also Katie Plummer, my partner, she's, we're all artists and we all work within, um, you know, a certain um, way of thinking um, that, you know, is easy to communicate. Mm. So rather than, you know, plucking strangers out of, um, out of extended social networks on, on Instagram, um, you know, I go straight to the source, particularly also um, with my kind of blood family, that is, there is the similar Eastern European transplanted to um, a different context understanding. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the stories, the family story, there are a few family stories that appear in connection of the sticks. Um, they are, they, they're, both of those stories are, um, or bits of those stories are key family myths. Um, you know, every family has family myths. And one of them is of my grandmother, my grandmother being present when um, an injured Nazi, you know, storms into their, um, into their hut in what's now Ukraine during the Second World War, demands food and he's given hot bread and the hot bread kills him. Well, that's the family story that hot bread can kill. Um, chances are he was just dying anyway. Um, but, you know, I like the idea of um, uh, matriarch of the family um, killing Nazis with bread. Like it's like pretty, it's a pretty, pretty cool image. Tam ich matko szmatko narażnie obrala kun chleba od piekarnia i skazając na ziste i jewo drygający pistolet tumnie i pokornie dala ete chleb na stór premier jewo. Soldat odrzucił pistolet na stór i zaczął jeść krótki chleb. Tryże na prosto stale, osmy trwając jewo. Niepewno on nagle następne, kogda on najad i on silny, kogda on on co polał jewo kracz, kogda u jewo budził smród. Na drodze do zakończenia tego ogromnego chleba, nazista nagle odrzuta od nacierpienia, łapał jewo z lutoć i krykał z bolu. And, and the other one is my, my grandfather, who was a child, um, spent several years in a POW camp in Siberia. And then at some point, they were all just let out and he had to make his own way through, you know, through Siberia, through um, the Urals, through Russia, um, and find his family at the age of 16 or something. Um, so, you know, also during the Second, Second World War. And, you know, and the, and the story in the film is of him having this moment of um, abandoning um, the idea of God and then refinding um, a God that's kind of, you know, a, a ancestral pre-Christian um, idea of spirituality while he's traveling through this vast Eastern European wasteland. Um, but also crucially, you know, my grandfather wasn't especially politically passionate, but he was, you know, he was in the party in Poland. He was a, le a regional leader or a trade leader. I'm not sure. Um, you know, he, he was invested to some extent um, in the project. And, um, and I think a lot of that came from these early years, you know, yeah. the, this experience, um, seeing the devastation of, of, of fascism tear through Eastern Europe. Dancing. Sorry? Dancing. Dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just one more question. Yeah. What is what is it about the dance that um, we see in all three of the films in the trilogy? That you're um, quite a good dancer, but tell, <laughs> tell us <laughs> what it is. Um, what is it I about mean, that partic those particular scenes? Yeah. I. I like I. I have you know three things that I re are really passionate about. <laughs> well, there are more, but there are three things. Um, one of them is geography. 
you know, that appears in the films. And the other one is language, you know, you know, which is very big, much a feature. And another one is dancing. Mm -hmm. And they, it's going to find its way into my work in some way or another. Um, I like the tradition of dance on screen as a genre of video art and, and filmmaking. Um, you know, there's some beautiful examples. Again, SBS in the 90s, you know, had a lot of this, particularly stuff from Canada and from um, France. Um, and it made a big impression on me as a teenager. And um, and because of this, I find I try to find an opportunity <laughs> to squeeze dance in every, anywhere I can in a video. And I also like the fact that it, you know, can be an explosion of a particular, you know, buildup. You know, if there's a narrative, not often there's narrative in my videos or something like narrative, it can kind of all spill over with a dance um, or it can be punctuated or it can be the final, you know, after so much language and, and there is a lot of, even if it's only in translation, you are getting a lot of talking, you know, there's a lot of text to read through, particularly in an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I like the idea of just communicating one last big ineffable thing through just you know bodies in space or body in space um yeah I feel, I feel like i'm certainly not done with trying to deal with dance in in my videos or something like dance you know specific you know dance in a very general sense like specific um non quotidian body movements in space <laughs>